Welcome back to another Black Lives Matter book discussion here at Ann Arbor District Library. Um, this time we read King and the Dragonflies by Case and Callender. Uh, before we get started with our discussion, how about we introduce ourselves? My name is Jacob. I am a member of the outreach team at Ann Arbor District Library. Um, so yes, who's next? Hello, my name is Marissa. I'm also on the outreach team with Jacob, and I am happy to be here. I'm Anne. I am a book processor, uh, primarily out of the Westgate branch. I'm Emily. I am a librarian. Uh, I'm extra excited to be here tonight because I buy uh, and maintain the kids' fiction collection, including a middle grade novel like the one we read tonight. Uh, but I mostly do events for adults. I'm Roosevelt. Uh, I'm a desk clerk. I'm mainly at the downtown and the Mallets Creek location. I'm Lucy. Um, I'm a library tech in the youth department. I do programming for kids and adults and really enjoy these book discussions. Hi, my name is Amanda. I work alongside Lucy in the youth department and I'm also a library technician and I'm happy to be here to discuss this great book. Yes. Now, before we get started, how about a short summary? And for me to do anything short is a challenge. So let's see how short this really is. Um, so King and the Dragonflies is about a 12 year old named Kingston. Um, they live in a small Louisiana town. Um, and his older brother, Khalid, unexpectedly passes away. So it's uh, Kingston, his brother who has passed, and his parents. Um, King's best friend is named Sandy. Sandy comes from a family, uh, a white family with known ties to the KKK. But Sandy confides a secret with King and says, hey, I think I might be gay. So without any spoiling, or let's, let's leave the spoiling for later in the discussion, um, let's talk about our initial reactions to our experiences reading this book. Um, I really liked this book. I actually read this book um, a couple of years ago. I, I, I'm a big reader of middle grade fiction, and this one came out, and I just thought it looked great. Um, it may have been the year it also won the National Book Award. Maybe that's why it was on my list. Um, but... I really liked the book. I thought it had really good voices. I love the some of the themes that were scattered throughout the book. And then for this book discussion, I listened to the audio and I didn't mind the audio. I was reading a critique on the narrator and I'm a picky person about narrators and I enjoyed the audio. I thought it was a really good um, kid's voice that was telling us the story of him and his family and everything that's going on in his life. So I'm excited to, to tear it apart and see what everybody thought and digest some of the themes throughout it. But I enjoyed it both times. Like you, Amanda, I listened to it on an audiobook, and it really reminded me of when I was a kid, and I used to be a really big audiobook listener. Uh, and I think it is that narrator quality. It, what makes a good narrator for a kid's audiobook uh, shares some of the traits of what makes a good narrator for one for grownups, but n there's also a special, like, you have to take a special pace when you're reading uh, for a younger audience. And I thought that the narrator did a really good job of that, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of those things might have been what was critiqued by uh, other listeners. Uh, but I really liked the book, and I liked that it dealt with complicated issues through the lens of a kid, but I think also recommend recognized that it was kids reading it, and so gave the reader also some context of like, who maybe I should talk to about if things like this happen in my life and what I might do differently than King if I were faced with this situation. I thought it did a really nice job of quietly providing a way that uh, younger readers can, uh, I hate to say learn some lessons, but learn some lessons uh, alongside a, a plot and characters that they cared about. Uh, I thought it handled things really well. I'm also a big reader of middle grade fiction, and I, I really enjoyed this book. I think it um, it really hit a lot of the notes of th that really take you back into what it's like to be that age. Like King is a, a smart, observant, like compassionate kid, and he's just not listened to. And I think that's that's an experience that really comes through very viscerally in this book. Um, uh, and it's also the prose itself is just so 
it's beautiful like whether it's the the descriptions that are so immersive of like the the set and setting of louisiana of the bayou or um those beautiful almost poetic uh dream narrations from khalid uh, i just really enjoyed the whole experience of this book well i for one don't usually read honey kids books generally <laughs> early chapter books middle grade i don't usually read a whole lot of them so i wasn't um i don't know i don't always like younger fiction because it's it's a hard line to walk without talking down to kids or where it's just really obvious that like this isn't realistic um so that's kind of what i went into it expecting but i really liked it i really liked the prose um it was well written it did feel um you know brought a tear to my eye more than once so <laughs> that was really sweet i mean i was i enjoyed it quite a bit actually it had been on my list for a while just because it had won some awards um but this was a good excuse to actually make myself read it and i'm glad that i did I went into this not knowing that it had any LGBTQ themes to it. So it was kind of a almost delightful discovery as I was reading it because books when I was growing up did not ever have those themes. Um, so I engaged in it a lot from that perspective. I also really enjoyed the kind of exploration of grief and loss and um, and the complications that come from hurtful things that may have been said that might not have even been meant. Um, and one of my, I, I'm going to jump right into a quote because I really like this quote. It's uh, towards the end of the book, but um, the Sandy at one point says, seems to me like the people who love you are the ones who do the most hurting. And that um, just to me kind of framed what a lot of the book was. It was people hurting each other or hurting King without actually having any malice um, to do so. This book does such an incredible job of covering really tough topics. And even as adult readers, um, or at least in my experience as, as an adult reading a book for middle grade um, folks, um, I was really impressed with the uh, delicacy and accuracy that the author Case and Calendar uses when talking about things like sexuality, grief, because um, it's, it's kind of an overwhelmingly sad book about grief and uh, child abuse, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How did you guys react to these big topics um, being approached in a middle grade novel and how successful did you find it? Um, I thought it was, um, as you were saying, Case and Calendar like does a really good job of, of approaching them sensitively, but but not shying away from them. And I think part of it is their, like the writing is so good and, um, I also think that the characters, all the characters are one. And one of the things I really loved about the book, especially for a middle grade um, novel, is that these are characters who are like you see how conflicted they are. And you also everybody seems to have this sort of it's not good and bad. That's too oversimplified. But, you know, good people can say bad things like you were saying, Anna, and good people can do bad things. And um I think that like every character, even, you know, even King is hurting people's feelings by what he's saying or not saying. And you look at how hurt he was by this one thing that his brother said. Um, so I just think that like to have characters that are that real throughout it, um, sort of, I don't know, it, it just makes the issues seem to unfold in a, in a more natural way. I thought it did such a beautiful job talking about grief and how grief reshapes and loss reshapes a family, um, especially like how it changed over the course of the book. So at the beginning, obviously, they had to let us know as readers what happened. 
um, and talked about things a little more directly. Uh, but then seeing as the book went on and about like how cooking was handled by the family. And I thought that was so interesting how how those roles changed. Uh, so the family is not just changing because Khalid is not there anymore. It's also changing, impacted by that, um, but is making everyone reassess and think about the role that they play in the family. And you get this not by the author or by King saying, well, my mom decided she was tired of cooking and my dad realized that he should step up and do some. It just slowly comes out. I thought it was just, I think it would be a book that would be helpful for a kid who is dealing with the loss of a sibling or the loss of another key family member. I think it would provide both comfort to see that you're not alone, even with a fictional character, but also show some structure for how to how working through it can look. One of the things with these um, these heavier themes, and since King is the narrator, he's a young kid, so we're seeing everything that's happening through his eyes, and he's learning as he goes. But also, um, really good middle grade fiction novels, like when there are friends that are involved in friendships. Um, young readers are going to immediately identify with that and try to not pick sides, but kind of understand what each of the kids who have different um, points of view are going through. And I think that having King as the narrator, you, I don't want to say that it's silly. But it's, a, it's sort of a more of an honest point of view because a kid is going to have, they're less jaded than like an adult who is trying to go through like, you know, death, racism, homophobia, all these like big topics. you got it through the lens of a 12 year old. So, I mean, it's a good and a bad thing because there's a lot of things you don't know, but you're also learning and you're honest with your friends and your family. And then eventually with yourself of how to manage the grief while also like wanting to be best friends with this person, but you're not supposed to talk to him because your dead brother said, don't talk to him because he's gay. Don't talk to him. But then the conversation about like, well, being homophobic and not playing with them because they're gay is the same thing as like not playing with somebody not playing with you because you're black. And so the revelations that we're going through with the kids, I thought it was just a really great lens to see it through this, this young voice. Cause it seems so like honest and true and just approachable in a, in a young reader novel. I think that's, that's something this book does that is, I think, key to like a, a successful middle grade novel is that it, it it doesn't like take an adult story and try to dumb it down. It, it respects the readers enough to tell the truth. Like this book is not shying away from what loss and grief look like from like the ways that it can isolate and the ways that it can bring people together and just the, the changes and the feelings, the really sort of ugly aspects of this completely personal and unique and in many ways unspeakable experience. This isn't something where the author is is trying to protect his audience from any of this. This is this is a, a book that knows how to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading it, I thought to myself, there's a lot of truth going on here. Is this going to repel young readers? I, am I appreciating this because I am an adult? And then I kind of thought about who I was as a kid. And man, I used to go to the library and just rip through books. And any any book that said the word gay, I'm reading it. Any book, you know, what I was going through, um, I was looking for those words and I was hungry for stories about that. So that was an interesting conversation that I had with myself. Um, what uh, for an adult who might be interested in reading this book? How would you sell it to them if they're like, I don't, I don't want to read no middle grade novel for an adult reader? What would you say to them? For me, I was kind of thinking of it as like a useful tool to think about how I would talk to like my nieces about certain issues. Like there's young people in my life. Like I don't have kids, but there's young people in my life and being able to like put yourself back in their mind is useful. Um, 
when they're thinking about like how to even communicate or bond with or whatever, help them going through their stuff. I mean, there's so many different like elements to this book. I think it's approachable for a lot of different reasons. If you're talking about race or just like the South or sexuality or any of that, or just friendship, like there's a lot in here that I think is useful for that. And just like, how would I talk to my little friend about any of these things? I don't know. Sometimes it's useful as an adult just to remember what it's like being as a, being a kid. <laughs> and I think this book does a really good job of that. I feel like this book is also um, can act as almost uh, explain it like I'm five for a lot of these topics. Um, you know, like uh, discussed earlier, the um, the similarities between or King pointing out, hey, if you're not associating with this person because they're gay, how is that different than that person not associating with me because I'm black? Um, um, and things like that are simple concepts that I don't know that adults think about a lot because we try to make things so complex. And sometimes it's nice to have something that just strips away all of the baggage. I think as an uh, as an adult, I had to think about this because as an adult who works with kids, I also just really love middle grade fiction. So for me, it's like, why does it, why don't adults want to read middle grade fiction? But I'm like, no, adults don't want to all read middle grade fiction or even teen fiction. You know, everyone has their things they enjoy. But I think with this book, number one, I would have to start with talking about middle grade fiction and why adults should just grab a couple middle grade fiction books and read them. But choose carefully. Don't just pick a random one off the, off of the shelf because you're going to read one. And some middle grade fiction books are great. They're wonderful for children, but they're not necessarily ones that I get lost into. I might enjoy the little dance I'm in with the kids in the world. But some of them are just super well done. And some of these authors are just knocking it out of the park with their language, with their characters, with their themes. Um, but this is definitely one that I would put like higher on my list of like my top 20 middle grade books that I would like try to put into the hands of a reluctant adult for middle grade fiction. Also, they're, they're quick reads. Middle grade fictions are quick reads. They're, it's nice to just sit with one for a couple hours. Um, but I think this book was really, really well done. It's really great writing. And I think it would be better to start with like a, a solid middle grade book rather than trying to just grab a random one and having like a bad experience with it or thinking it's too simplistic for an adult mind um, and then being turned off with middle grade. So I definitely would think this was like, for me personally, it's higher on my list. Um, but again, impartial. And I think this book too has like, um, it, it talks about what we think of a lot as like adult emotions, right? Like dealing with grief and thinking about um, race and thinking about sexuality. So like you were saying, Anne, that's kind of there, but it's, it's simplified. And so uh, adults might be surprised to find a book that does this. One thing I think that's great about middle grade is that like no matter what it gets into, I think it has to end on a note of hope. That's kind of like a, you know, a hallmark of a, of a middle grade book, but that doesn't mean that it can't be like deeply sad and deeply moving throughout the story. And I even think about like what I liked to read when I was younger. And I feel like I was just always drawn to like the sad, like, is this going to make me cry at some point? You know, like that's the one I want to read. And I think there's just something about reading anything, whether it's for kids or adults, that if it's really going to stir some feeling or emotion in you, um, it's definitely worth reading. And I would say that this book in particular earns those emotional reactions. There's no cheap shots. It's, um, it feels so incredibly real. And there's something to also be said about simple emotions versus complex emotions. The simplest things can be the most complex things, and the most complex things can be the most simple. And that's this book remind, was a constant reminder of that. Um, I'd like to know what you guys made of the different personal relationships in the book. Um, how did you react to King's friendship with Sandy? Now, there's the um, King is black, Sandy is white, and Sandy's family has a history of hating black people. But Sandy is a very unique kind of character. Their relationship is really singular and special. Um, so I, I wanted to know how you guys reacted to their friendship. 
I loved Sandy. I was I was so charmed by him. Uh, you know, he's one of those kids that the grandmas refer to as old souls. Like he just had a perspective that um, perhaps isn't realistic, but I didn't care because I I was just so delighted by him. And I loved how he saw that King was a complicated human being and that all human beings are complicated. And so granted him some grace uh, and didn't write him off after King behaved poorly, but also didn't let him just ride by scot-free. I thought that that was just the the relationships and them figuring out who they are as individuals and as friends and the way that that unfolds over the book was just beautiful. And I think it's real too. Like if you think about like friendships in middle school, you're changing in middle school and those friendships change. Some people fade out of your life and new people come into your life. And so you watch um, King and Sandy and I forget what the girl's name was. Um, you Jasmine. Watch Jasmine. Yeah. Jazz. You watch them kind of go in and out and how they still want to be friends, but they're also like figuring out how their puzzle pieces as friends fit together with some of their new roles or new things that they're exploring or learning or going through. Because middle school is the time when all that stuff is up in the air. I thought it was interesting and so real the way that secrets factored into their relationship, the way their relationship oh. pivoted around the things that they couldn't tell other people. Like the the way that the the secret, the mutual secret that uh, that Sandy is gay and that King thinks he might be gay sort of is the like a shattering point for their relationship. And then later there's um, when he's hiding Sandy and he's conflicted about, you know, well, he's he he tells people that Sandy is gay and then he doesn't tell people where Sandy's hiding. Um, and then Sandy there's like the last secret where Sandy is like, I'm going to be, I'm going to leave. I'm going to run away. Uh, and King does decide to tell an adult about that one. So like the way that their relationships are defined by like the secrets that Sandy entrusts to King and what King chooses to do with the information. Like, is this a secret? Like, um, like Khalid said that like, that is to keep for yourself, or is this a secret that an adult needs to know about? or is this somewhere in between? You know, I haven't, I didn't even think about that, that for middle schoolers and even high schoolers, and let's face it, for adults, secrets are like the cornerstone of like, oh my gosh. What did you guys make of, of the larger friend group? Uh, there was Camille, who was a little bit saucy and kind of the leader and a little bit bossy. Um, his friend Anthony and Daryl. Outside of his relationship with Sandy, how did you see him relate to his other friends? And, and of course, Jasmine. I feel like I've talked so much, but I loved it. It felt like middle school friendship and like the ways where the power dynamics are kind of shifting. And as, you know, someone becomes a bit of a leader and usually like that might be a different person than who was the leader in elementary school and the, the crushes on each other and learning how to like suddenly friendship has gotten more complicated between boys and girls. Um, I just thought it was such a realistic portrayal of how that so often shakes out with even the friends who we didn't see as much of like the B character friends I still felt like I had a sense of who they were yeah I thought um King's relationship with Jasmine was really interesting and and very well depicted like the part when it's basically like well is it me you're writing you like me and and she's like yes I do do you like me and he's like uh yes and then all of a sudden they're like okay we're boyfriend and girlfriend and without like any and that's just so I think how it happens you know and then you get home and you're like darn what happened um and I just like that was such a spot on depiction of like how I remember middle school or, or even earlier like you know relationships just just um blooming and so i like i appreciated those little moments but that um and then that king's in this situation that where he's complicated things for himself once again but that part just really uh i was like yeah i i can identify with that yeah there's something so sweet about crushes when you're a kid and it's just 
first crushes and it's like, what is a crush? And I really like this person, but as a friend or more than a friend? And what is that? And then are you just together? And it's just so cute. Such a time of like, just like figuring it out and like wanting answers because it's so stressful and it feels so intense, even though it's like such a a thing that doesn't really matter in like life. But as at the time, it like matters so much. (laughs) So it felt like all of those things at once. It was really impressive to have like all of that uh, stress related to it as well of like, yeah, I kind of like, was it Brianna? But she's too tall and like people will laugh at me because she's too tall. (laughs) Just like all of that, um, that pressure that like, where does that even come from at that age? Yeah, the friendship with Daryl was was really interesting to me. He's like sort of the the peer pressure, the like, um, the sort of, I mean, he's a little too young for, well, I guess toxic masculinity affects us all, but, um, he, he's sort of embodying, like, she's too tall for me. And here's what the boy and the girl are supposed to do. And it's weird that Sandy is gay and really pushing back against all of King's, um, trying to, break away from it and really policing i guess he's the he's the uh friend who seems to police king's social behavior the most and it's really telling that by the end he's one of the people that king chooses not to disclose his truth to um yeah he just he just uh it was interesting the ways that he kept surfacing in those pivotal moments to just put the pressure back on and then of course the moment where uh where uh the idea first surfaces in his mind that like oh do i like jasmine what would that mean we would we have to hold hands and would we have to go to dances like oh uh oh uh oh i recognize that language (laughs) that was it was all very real it's like of course i like jasmine she's my best friend we talk about anime we make comics together so yeah i like jasmine but like uh um um Daryl is acting like he he's acting the way he thinks he's supposed to act. Ooh, tall, gross. Ooh, gay. Oh, bad. But King is kind of questioning um, um, how he's supposed to act. And he has a very kind of a strong sense of right and wrong. Um, are there places in the book that you think back on where that sense of right and wrong comes to a head or gets him into trouble like it makes me think of his relationship with his father um especially when the father says like i love you and king's like whoa am i am i gonna say it back no because that's weird because my dad broke the rules but the next time he says it i know it's the right thing to do so i'm gonna try it out um which is so, uh, yeah, that resonates. But this sense of right and wrong, where else do you see that in the book with King? And really, why do you think he has this sense of right and wrong and and the others don't, including the adults? I kind of want to say it's easier for kids to see right and wrong sometimes because we teach kids like a very simple like share uh, you know, don't steal. Like, it's very simplified, and so it's a little more black and white sometimes. And they're still learning some of that, and it just, you feel it. And then as an adult, when you're like, it's complicated, or like, yeah, I know, maybe his dad beats him, but like, what do you do? There's nothing I can do. Um, just the complications of life. Well, one thing that a couple of us already mentioned, too, was um, how King is fiercely trying to not be friends with Sandy because he's gay and his brother told him. Not that he's gay, but his brother told him not to be friends with him because he's gay. That's just the after part. Don't be friends with Sandy because he's gay. And then he wants to listen to him, be, or his brother, because his brother is gone. He wants to like uphold their relationship and he just loves him. And he's the older brother who knows all of the things. He's the one he's supposed to learn all of these life lessons from. But as the book goes by, he slowly is realizing that that's not a great choice that's not a good attitude to have and he doesn't want to do that but part of it is like realizing that it's wrong but also like letting his brother down Um, but inevitably he makes like the right choice and he is able to 
to see that him not hanging out with Sandy is the same thing as somebody not hanging out with him because he's black. So poor little King was just struggling with so many things. Yeah, I think that like the right and the sense of right and wrong too, like what you were saying, Marissa, about the, you know, kids really see this sense of black and white, but it's so hard when they push up against things that are gray and like the adult world is very gray and so nuanced. And so it's like this, I think that's another great thing about this book. It's like that really that pivotal moment for King when he's kind of like switching from that black and white thinking into gray. But, you know, like again with his dad saying like men don't cry, but I'm crying, you know, it's so super confusing but it's also like how do you as a kid take this messaging that you've received your whole life and then like have to shift it all of a sudden not because of what adults are telling you to do but because of how you notice that they're not doing what they said they should do you know it's it's really um so like so much of the book really exists in that space and and I think that's just um I don't know, it's really well done I did notice also that Jasmine sort of is centered as a as a moral compass for King, in addition to his like innate sense of like things that he knows to be true, but that are um, that are not matching up with reality. Jasmine, he keeps turning back to like, I know Jasmine would tell me that that was ignorant of me, or I know Jasmine would be disappointed in me, or like, here's what Jasmine would say, which is something that you see a lot with like supporting female characters. Um, uh, I, unfortunately, I don't think she was the most um, uh, three dimensional in that sense. But um, but she, you know, she came back again and again whenever he was uh, thinking about like, is this the right thing to do or say in this situation? It's Jasmine. I found myself wanting a Jasmine book because um, I just love that character so much. But I'm like, there's more. There's more. Um, one of my favorite meetings of black and white and gray is when King decides to show Sandy the shack in the middle of the bayou. Um, and I would say that's probably some of my favorite scenes. I would say they are my favorite scenes from the book when, um, Sandy is catching a fish. They're going to fry up a fish or they're having a late night heart to heart in this kind of um, space of their own, which is not their own at all, which is so true to life. Um, what were your favorite scenes or moments from the book and what made them your favorite? I I really liked those scenes as well. And part of what I liked with that and just the runaway story in general is that that is kind of a storyline that exists in children's literature that doesn't exist in grown-up literature. And it certainly doesn't exist as a, this is a positive thing for these kids to be doing. But you really get the, the feeling or sense that this is a healthy thing for them in this situation. I don't know. Those are some of my favorite scenes as well. And I feel like with those, it was it's sort of a release from everything that was going on outside of the reality. Like when they were at the shack or by the pond or by the in the bayou, they were not with other people. They were that, you know, they could, it was a, an escape. Um, but they were also sort of like in this little mini fantasy land of runaway that is as an adult reader, you know, like it's not gonna end he's not going to live in that shack forever and there's going to be a happy ending. Even as a kid who was reading, it might think, oh, that's not going to work. What about his dad? His dad's a police. Um, but I just really appreciated that little like break of, to have that escape for them to just rekindle their friendship and then also discover other things and just bond over reading comics and looking at the shack and making it all work and finding a match or something. And it's like the best place in the whole entire universe when it's just about to fall apart in five minutes. <laughs> That was my favorite too. I loved the cooking of the fish. I loved how he King was so impressed that he knew how to do it and was like, really could have used some seasonings though, but I guess we didn't have any. So pretty cool still. And I was just so tickled by it. Uh, I really liked Auntie Idris's house when they got there. 
it was just such a great counterpoint to what he had been experiencing at home and just a beautiful character who can kind of help bridge between King and his parents. And like, um, and then also the scene before that where they're driving in the car, just because this is not a great scene, but it just made me feel a lot of feelings where it's just the anxiety of you, you know, you're in trouble and they're sitting in silence driving. And it was something like, we're not having a conversation. So I'm just going to imagine what they're saying to me. And it's all of the worst things of like, you're not my son anymore. I don't like you. And like, you're not family. And it's just like, it felt really like intense and emotional. And then there's Auntie Idris, who's just like this beautiful, caring, wonderful aunt who comes in and is just helps calm everybody down and bring them back together. I thought Auntie Idris was such an interesting character. And I wanted to talk about what does Auntie Idris understand about life that King's parents don't? I'm like, what? Of course, there's differences between the characters, but what are what makes them so different? What makes Auntie Idris so magical in, in, in uh caring? What does she see that they don't? I think she sees how badly King needs to be listened to. Like, King has so much to say to his parents, but they're less interested in his words and more interested in his tone or his volume throughout so much of the book, even when he's telling them something so important. Like, I think my friend is being physically abused um, or or trying to tell them truths about himself or about the feelings that he's grappling with. And he's, uh, they're just, their their response is to tell him to stop yelling or, or to watch their to watch his tone with them um but auntie idris is just calmly telling them to listen to the words that he's saying to give them a chance to to talk and that's really absolutely all he needs in that moment it's almost like auntie idris is always uh, prefaces the wisdom she's going to bestow by being like, you're okay, you're safe. But let me tell you something. And his parents are like, let me tell you something. And then a few days later, they're like, but you're safe and you're loved and you're okay. Um, yeah, loved that character. Oh my gosh. Um, I wanted to also discuss... Uh, so. King's older brother, Khalid, dies unexpectedly in the middle of a soccer field from what they believe to be a heart attack. They have no idea really why this young man passed so suddenly. And uh, Khalid comes back to King in his dreams. Also, King has a um, kind of a, a unique, different relationship with his brother because his brother speaks in his sleep. What did you guys make of Khalid's sleep talking? And what did you make of of, of King's um, kind of, I don't want to say obsession, because that's like a negative connotation word. But like, King is taking notes of what his brother's talking about in his sleep. What What is all that about? Well, the, the taking notes, I think, is just older brother worship. Um, you know, kind of wanting to hang on everything that he's saying and he was saying some pretty interesting things so i understand after a few of those nights being like i want to keep track of this um but as far as khalid coming to him in his dreams i don't know if that is i don't know if there's an intended link between those two things happening at night um, I don't know. I'm going to jump off that because I think there is something in the fact that we're more vulnerable at night. Uh, when we're sleeping, we can't control our surroundings. And sure, sometimes it might be annoying when you're trying to sleep and your brother's talking. I, I shared a room with a sleep talker and it, it it's, it's you're, you are forced to be there. Um, but I think that 
idea in that like softer time when you're more vulnerable and you aren't quite you're still you but you're not in con you're less in control of who you are i think like the seeing his brother in his sleep you know that's that's the way he got to see him and that was the way that he got to still have those connections uh and that it came in that kind of magical hour when he already had his brother, even when his brother was living, uh, his brother communicated with him in a weird way at that time. Uh, so I thought that they really nicely paralleled each other. Yeah, I thought I thought they'd give it, there was this kind of magical sense to it, but I think it's just because it's like the whole dreamlike quality. Um, but then I think it's also like that magical element that is even like in the book at all that allows king to like believe that his brother is a dragonfly you know and that i think that also sort of mirrors it just like even the imagery of the of dragonflies and um oh, oh. no <laughs> frozenness lucy you're frozen and you were saying something amazing um in the meantime and we'll get back to what lucy was saying i have in my notes i have this question written and if you have a dumbfounded face and nobody's response, I get it. And that's okay. But let me just say, why dragonflies? Well, one of the only quote I wrote down was King asking that question. He says, I wanted to ask him, why did you choose a dragonfly? Why not something cooler, like a lion or a panther or a wolf? Like that that's on page one of the book to introduce us to King and his uh the memory of his brother. And I thought that was a great way to introduce them. And then he also had like a, what he thought his brother would say. He says, because I can, it was my choice and that's what I chose. And King admitted that he knew that, that his brother was right in choosing a dragonfly. But I like that little mini conversation he has in his head. Um, but I can't answer why dragonflies or why that was chosen for the book. Um, I think something light, something that flies is a really good like a lot of times when people are grieving or even people in my life, like it's usually like birds and butterflies and things that people see out in the universe because they kind of, they dip in and out when you're not expecting them. And so for this, I really like, I think actually I know somebody in my life who has a person that's a dragonfly. There's just a way for them to drift in and out. They're like, oh, they're saying hello, or they, they know I'm here, or just to have them in that moment with you. So for me, it just kind of tied in with that theme of like winged things representing this this being that is no longer here with us. There is something kind of ethereal or magical about dragonflies that fit in with that theme of the book. Mm -hmm. Sparkly wings, sparkly wings. <laughs> yeah, I took it as that, like the, the, the colors of the wings too and how iridescent they are. And like, you know, they're all into this, the, secrets of the universe being revealed in Khalid's dreams of and the colors of the sky and all I don't know it kind of like just fit together neatly I think it also is like you know King's a sensitive kid and I kind of got the impression that his brother probably wasn't as sensitive but in his sleep he is or he can voice these really sensitive like beauty of the world or beauty of the dreams and then it's also like such a it's not a unique experience to lose someone and to dream about them and to have that thought of like is this them visiting me or is it just a dream and you know you're missing someone and it's a lot uh i i must admit i did struggle with the sleep talking a little bit because it was just so incredibly profound like this some like deepak chopra like metaphysical i'm like okay okay yes i'll go with it because i love this book but it got a little bit um, um i don't know what the right word is it, very philosophical i totally know what you mean and i think that's where i give it some middle grade grace because they have to tell the same story in so many fewer pages and they have to make sure that young readers who maybe have not spent time sitting with even the idea of what a metaphor could be can get it. So I had the same thing where I started it went, and I was like, oh, really? Again, I shared a room with a sleep talker. It's never that deep. <laughs> it as to fit in for the world that it was, it needed to be. And so I said, all right, Emily, accept this. And then I said, okay, I accept it. 
this could this was my way of of engaging with it and i might have been i might be wrong about this because i don't have the text in front of me i was an audiobook listener as well i i feel like there was some some prophetic elements to the dreams like there were there were things talking about like he, he spoke to king a lot about like what king will do and how king is going to be okay um so i was i was i was digging for those um and also just sort of reading them as like poetry because like his brother is just as reading poetry in his sleep um so that that was just how i engaged with those i kind of had to skim it a little bit because i had the same thought of like it's a little much and it takes <laughs> me out of the story so i'm just gonna go with it <laughs> Um, Lucy, we're so glad that you were back. You were saying something amazing, and then you disappeared, and then uh, I forgot power, what you were my saying. Power, my power went out. Why? No. Yeah, it came back, but like, um, yes, yeah, so I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, and if you do remember, you just holler. Um, okay, I just checked the clock. Oh my gosh! Whoa. Um, something else I wanted to talk about before as we're nearing our um end time here is that i thought the setting of the book uh how do i say this i love books about people who are not middle class or upper class um i grew up in zilwaukee michigan so it's like yeah we need some more stories like that um how does this small town louisiana setting play into the story um, in it's like this story could really couldn't happen anywhere else. But I want to know if anybody else connected with this setting, and uh, what you guys think? I really liked that there wasn't it wasn't trying to frame it with a like like a pity lens at any point. It was like so. I mean, it was just a fact of life that um, that King's parents both work, and that King and his brother share a bed. And uh, it's admirable and extremely impressive that Sandy can can like hunt and fish and and like skin a rabbit and like prepare a fish and like th these are these are skills that were born out of poverty. But there's never like there's never a moment where the narration's like, oh, it's so sad that these are his circumstances. It's just this is his life, and we're we're rightfully impressed at the skills that he's cultivated. I really liked the setting. I love a good story from the bayou. Um, but I think that the author did something so masterful where it's like there's still some tension between Sandy and King, where they both seem to be kind of similar levels of like wealth. But Sandy's like, well, you had food on the table and you have your mom and like you have such a perfect life and like like recognizing that. And then later when he's in Sandy's neighborhood, he's like, all these houses are really nice. Like, this is not what I was expecting. But it's still like this interesting tension that isn't like fully explored. But I definitely noticed because it was like one sentence um, of just like how different races experience class and what it might look like. Um, also, it's just, yeah, interesting that they had mentioned specifically, like, food insecurity and how he was really just left to, like, feed himself, um, but didn't dwell on it or make it, like, yeah, a pity party um, or, like, a gross way, like, exploitative. So I appreciated that. I think very often in books, it can be, like, the sad poor people had lucky charms and they lived in a sad, gray, shiny trailer where it was sad and they had there was dead grass everywhere, which makes it even sadder because these people are really sad. And it's like, there was none of that in this book, which is so, uh, one of those other things that if I was a kid who was ravenously tearing through the library to find books about my experience, I would be like, nice. Or be like, this is like me. Or uh, in some part, this is like me, as opposed to reading, you know, I don't know, something else. Um, I thought it was so wonderful at the end of the book to have Mardi Gras. What, what is it about Mardi Gras and what's happening with the characters? How What's that connection, if any?
And I guess also, what did you guys think of the ending as the book ends with um, King and his family going to Mardi Gras? So what did you think about Mardi Gras? And what did you think about the ending of the book in general? Any spoilers beware? Well, I think I was... One of the things why, or for, like, Mardi Gras was pointy because that was something they did as a family. And this was, they were actually going to, like, he's taking it back. We're actually going to go to Mardi Gras, but Khalid's not here. How can we go to Mardi Gras? Oh, we're still going to Mardi Gras. So that was, and it could have been anywhere. They could have been going to the zoo or the circus or the what. But for their family, it was just Mardi Gras. Um, What I also, I thought it was kind of neat that that was also where, like, Sandy was going to run away to. Because, like, Mardi Gras is huge. And this is, like, a child. And it's a great place to get, to get lost and disappear. I, again, Lucy mentioned earlier about that happy ending and a lot of middle grade books will have like this fantastical, not fantastical as in magic, but just like this fantastical, like wrapping up kind of like happy endings where people and places are coming together. And I think that that kind of ties into, to the ending and being wrapped up really well done, but Yeah, it wrapped up well and relatively happily, but still, it was more of a, it'll be okay ending versus uh, everybody's happy, everything's great, Um, which I appreciated, but I also appreciated as I was getting towards the end, knowing that it probably was going to have a a not bad ending. the the one thing that as i was reading i thought if this were an adult book this would be way longer because i got to the point where you know you're at mardi gras and i'm like how do i only have 15 pages left because this whole runaway thing is happening and da, da, da. and it's like okay we're in a kids book we're just bringing it back in I think it's interesting. Well, at least to me, I don't know if this is accurate. I've never been to Mardi Gras, but it always has seemed to me as like a festival of life, essentially. Um, So that's interesting that it kind of happens. I don't know if it's, I have nothing more deep than that to thought, but (laughs) it's interesting. And then, yeah, I was expecting kind of a happy ending for a middle grade book. Um, I tried not to roll my eyes too much at the like yep and sheriff sanders was caught and found guilty and fired and she'll never (laughs) do anything bad again i was like yeah this will never happen but we can pretend well to add to to yours marissa about mardi gras being a celebration of life it's it also is sort of the moment when the family moves into like the acceptance phase of grieving and is able to like celebrate Khalid's life like they're able to start singing his songs and laughing at his memories like moving on from this you know this place where they're all three in their separate isolated little pods of grief into into you know coming together to celebrate Khalid and that makes me think about the idea of Khalid as a dragonfly and that like you don't know when the dragonfly is going to fly back into your life you don't know when the things are going to remind you of him and he's going to come back in your life. And so to see the family not shoo the dragonfly away, they're, they're welcoming and appreciating and enjoying it and figuring out who they are. Like what a sign that it, things will be okay. Eventually it was beautiful. Dang, that's, that's why I love these discussions so much because it's like, yeah, deep down, I, I, I kind of realized something like that. But to hear all of you kind of put words to it and do a really good job talking about the book, I'm like, yeah, that, that. Um, Is there anything about the book that we did not discuss that you'd like to mention? Well, I mean, I mean, the one thing I kept coming back to was what you just said, like the things that we know, but we don't speak like that's that's a huge part of this book, like towards the end when he says like i've always known my brother's not a dragonfly and i I feel like i caught parts again i don't have the text so i can't say for sure but i feel like i caught i caught parts before the end where he says i'm gay instead of i think i might be gay like i I think i think he knows that for a lot longer for, for a lot sooner than he is able to say it like there's a lot in this book about like the things that we know but we can't say yet 
this. Okay. Wow. Well, it's been wonderful to um, discuss this wonderful book with you guys. It, with these few minutes we have left here, if somebody went to, were to say, I really love King and the Dragonflies, does anybody have any other suggestions, whether that be a book or movie, TV, whatever it might be, you'd go, oh, then you'd really like? I don't know. It's so singular. It's so... I would almost say like, and it's very, she's a very different writer, but I think that like, she's someone who doesn't shy away from getting into hard stuff. And then it's Kate to Camilla with a lot of her middle grade stuff, like because of Win Dixie almost, or even some of the more fantastical stuff, but she definitely takes you into those um, very real, very complex emotions with these nuanced conversations around them. But she is, and like, in fact, I, I heard an interview with her once where she was like, the, with middle grade or with kids books, like, I'm not going to, I'm going to write the book I want to write, the adult book, whatever. But it does, that's where I thought about, like, it does have to end on a note of hope. It doesn't have to be happy. You just have to, as everyone here was saying, know that things are going to maybe be okay. But so Kate to Camilla, I could see some of the books being um, books that people who like this would like, though they're different characters, different author. Well, okay, y'all. Thank you so much for taking the time to read this book and having the chutzpah to come discuss it on film, which we'll now post on YouTube. So thank you for all of that. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful evening.